There are different terms for interlanguage. According to Larry Selinker, this is interlanguage. For NEMSER, the term is approximative systems. According to Corder, idiosyncratic dialects or transitional competence. Interlanguage is the stage of a language learner's language. It's the language, it's the grammar of a language learner. It's not the well-formed grammar yet, okay? It's a continuum, okay? It's the interlocking stages of interlanguage. You have this interlanguage, you have interlanguage two, interlanguage three, and then it becomes interlanguage four until it becomes native like English. So according to according to Nemser, they are approximative systems. They approximate English. According to Corder, they are transitional competence. It's like transitional grammar. It's not yet grammar of English, it's just transitional com competence. It's like, again, the stages in a life cycle. So think of these stages as your interlanguage. Your, at this stage, your interlanguage looks like this. At this stage, your interlanguage looks like this. At this stage, your interlanguage looks like this. At this stage, your interlanguage only has word order everything else doesn't look nice and then it becomes a little more like english now you have acquired past tense and then in the next stage of your interlanguage you have acquired the plurals the possessives wow. and then finally after so many time your interlanguage looks like native english that's the idea of interlanguage. Okay. According to Nemster, the interlanguage is distinct from both the first language and second language. So you have Filipino, and then you try to learn English, you have an interlanguage. Okay, what you don't what you know is not yet English. What you know is interlanguage like the early stages of English, but it's not English. It is an approximation of English. And it's not Filipino, it's not English. It's distinct from the first language and the second language. You can think of interlanguages as forming an evolving series. At the start, it's just a bunch of cells, and then later on, the head is formed. You have things that look like arms and feet, but they're not very much like feet. But then they develop, develop until finally it looks like a baby. That's the idea of interlanguage. According to them, sir, the form of interlanguages of all language learners in a given stage are very similar. This is very similar to what Stephen Crashton said. A learner, a second language learner, or a child language, first language learner, progresses from one stage of interlanguage to another through hypothesis testing. When, when, when a child has an idea of what the language is, he will utter a sentence he will give an utterance based on what he thinks the language is based on what he thinks about the grammar it's a way of testing his hypothesis about the grammar so interlanguage is a bunch of a child's hypothesis about the grammar maybe it's like this maybe it's like that let me try so a child will give an utterance and he will he or she will receive feedback and based on that feedback the feedback by the way has to do with whether the person understands him or not not verbal correction of the grammar 
So what he does is he says something and he will see if somebody understands him. If not, then he will reconstruct his hypothesis about the grammar. Okay. So both kinds of learners, children learning the first language and adult learners of a second language use similar strategies, specifically making use of errors. The errors will help them reconstruct their hypothesis about the language. Now, according to Larry Selinker, there are five principal processes of interlanguage. First is language transfer. First language impact is seen as intercession instead of interference, meaning a language learner learns on the first language if there are not much second language resources available. Very similar to what Krashen says, that the first language is like a bridge for facilitating communication. I had a Spanish friend from, from Panama I do to my, he says, I do to my hair what we say in Spanish as parejar. So what do you think in English was my Latino friend trying to say? Well, he was trying to say that he was trying to even his hair. Because it's combed in one place, but in one another place, it's not yet combed. So what he does is to parejar, to equalize to equalize the combing of his hair. Now, he doesn't know the term equalize or even. So I told him, you are trying to even your hair. So, But he, at that time, he still didn't know the term even or equalize. So he used the Spanish parejar. Okay, pinareho niya. Okay, I do to my hair what we say in Spanish as parejar. He evens the the combing of his hair. When he expressed that, he still didn't know the term equalize or even, so he leaned on his Spanish words. So that's what Nemser is trying to say. Or in, in Filipino, in your classrooms, when you have English, I'm sure you have students when they, when they could not express something in English, they would say, Mom, in Tagalog po, it's okay. So that's the idea of using the first language as a bridge. Okay. Another principle is the overgeneralization of second language rules, such as what did he intended to say? So he here the overgeneralization is to apply the ED to the past tense. The language learner doesn't know that if you already have did, you should not put ed anymore but in this case the language learner used ed and did at the same time another example after thinking little i decided to start on the bicycle as slowly as i could as it was not possible to drive fast so the language learner here thought that all vehicles are driven okay there's overgeneralization because bicycles are driven. They are ridden. You don't drive a bike. You ride a bike. Okay? You ride a bicycle. You don't drive a bicycle. But according uh, it, uh, in the perception of the language learner, all vehicles are driven. So even in the case of the bicycle, he used the word drive. Another learner said, Max is happier than Sam's these days. He thought that is can always be contracted to apostrophe S. Max is happier than Sam's these days. When it should be, Max is happier than Sam is these days. And you cannot contract. So the, the language learner thought that he could track, he could contract all is into apostrophe s so that's the second principle over generalization of rules third is 
transfer of training. This has to do with how a person was trained in learning the second language. For example, Serbo-Croatian Serbo speakers at all levels of English proficiency use he on almost every, every occasion wherever he or she would be called for. Now, this is not interference because in Serbo-Croatian, there is also he and she. So you cannot say that this is transfer effect. This is interference because there's also he and she in Serbo-Croatian. However, in the way English is taught and used in Serbia, Croatia, the he is used where he or she is supposed to be used. In the way English is taught and used in Croatia, in Serbia, Croatia, the he is always used wherever he or she is supposed to be used. That's transfer of training. Another principle is strategies of second language learning. If the learner, for example, has adopted the strategy that all verbs are either transitive or intransitive, he may produce interlanguage forms such as, I am feeling thirsty. Instead of saying, I feel thirsty. Or, don't worry, I'm hearing him. Okay? So he uses the progressive, but in fact, it should not be because he has adopted the strategy that all verbs are either transitive or intransitive. Okay, he thought that you have to use the in all the time. Number five, strategies of second language communication such as avoiding grammatical formatives such as articles, plural forms, and past tense forms. So avoid thinking about proper grammar because it makes one speak hesitantly, making native speakers impatient with them. So in order to, to avoid... Uh, in order to avoid impeding communication, the foreigner, the language learner, avoids structures that would make him think. So for example, it was nice, nice trailer, big one. So it took, the, the language learner took away the prepositions. For example, I have many hundred carpenter my own meaning I have a lot of carpenters, a hundred carpenters under my employee. But here, the language learner did not use the plural because it makes him think, which would impede communication. I was in Frankfurt when I fill application. So there's no past tense because it makes the language learner think about complex structures. Okay, so one way, one strategy is avoiding grammatical formatives. So it has to do with strategies. Now in interlanguage, the acquisition device, uh, is highlighted. According to Lenberg, the term is latent language structure. According to interlanguage theory, the acquisition device is responsible for language learning, but it is usually not available after a certain age, probably pu puberty. Salinker says that adults who achieve native-like proficiency are able to make use or reactivate the acquisition device even after puberty. They are able, like the child, to transform the universal grammar into the structure of the target language. They are able to chip away at the unformed universal grammar to turn it into a statue. Now, adults who do not achieve native-like proficiency are unable to make use of the acquisition device because it's the acquisition device 
that produces native-like proficiency. However, they are able to use a more general cognitive me mechanism called latent psychological structure. Although they're not able to use the acquisition device to learn a language, they use the more general faculties of the brain in order to learn language. So it's not only through the acquisition device that adults can learn language, they can also make use of other cognitive functions, but it doesn't produce the native-like proficiency. Now, Dula and Bert use the term cognit cognitive organizer for the mechanisms responsible for non-acquisition device language learning. Okay? According to them, it's the cognitive organizer. These are mechanisms for language learning without using the acquisition device and the universal grammar. It's used in creative construction, meaning learners organize the language that they hear. Creative construction. Organizing the language that one hears without using the universal grammar or the acquisition device. Let's now talk about fossilization. This is when a learner stops learning the target language even when there are still forms in his interlanguage that are not the same as the target language. The term that John Schumann used this is called pigeonization. If you remember the case of Alberto, uh, John Schumann's case study, Alberto only wants to learn English as much as he can work as a fruit picker. Apart from that, he doesn't want to learn any more English. That's why he stopped learning the target languages, which is English, even though there are still forms in his interlanguage that are not the same as the target language, which is English, because he doesn't need that much English in order to earn money. So that is called fossilization. I'm sure you have students who keep on making those grammatical mistakes. You've been, you, you've taught them in grade one. They have this grammatical mistake. You've, you, you become their teacher in grade six, but they still have those grammatical errors. They're fossilized already. Now, there are two kinds of fossilization, the fossilization of correct forms and the fossilization of errors. And it's the fossilization of errors that is an issue for us. Here are examples. When the French use the uvular R in their English interlanguage, that's the uvular R, instead of, say, instead of using the R, they would use the R. So in Canada, there's, there's lots of that. Now, Americans who learn French, they end up speaking, they end up using R, R, instead of R in French. Okay, those are fossilized grammat, uh, pronunciation errors. Another example is when English uses stress time rhythm when speaking Spanish. Sorry about that. You know, language Spanish is syllable time. It's not stress time, unlike English. But sometimes English speak with stress time rhythm when speaking Spanish. That is uh, fossilization. Like when Chinese talk like uh, English rhythm in their interlanguage relative to Spanish and so on. That syllable time, uh, syllable time rhythm coming from Chinese into English instead of using stress time rhythm. Now there are two possible causes. One is the learner has decided that he does not need to develop his interlanguage further to communicate. 
just like Alberto, because he realized that his level of English is already enough for him to earn enough money as a fruit picker. So he didn't try to develop English anymore. Another one is that the neural networks in the brain have changed in a way that prevents more learning. This is loss of plasticity. The brain is plastic, meaning it can be molded. Now, when the brain loses plasticity, that's the time that the neural work networks prevent more learning. Okay, because the brain has lost what is called plasticity. Okay, let's talk about three characters of interlanguage. First, language learner language is permeable, meaning grammar rules can be amended, they can be changed. Now, when the grammar rules can no longer be amended, that's when we have fossilization. So fossilization is seen as the loss of permeability or plasticity. Language learner is dynamic. It's always changing, but on a slow pace. And through gradual application and extension of rules to more context, the language learner language changes. And language learner is systematic. Language learner language is rule-based. Therefore, in itself, language learner language produces correct sentences. All the utterances a person says is correct as far as the internal rules that he has are. It's only erroneous compo compared to the target language. Maybe the analogy here would be the terrorists. I know, um, Islamic terrorists, Muslim terrorists believe that what they're doing is correct. So everything that they do is consistent to their own moral code. Maybe Adolf Hitler is like that too. I'm, I wonder that if he sincerely believed that Jews were bad people, so all his actions were consistent with that moral code. No, I'm not sure about that. I'm just using it as an illustration with you. Okay. Okay, you've seen this in the case of uh, fashion that grammatical fe features acquired are changing depending on the stage. This shows that grammar rules are permeable because the, the brain is permeable, it's plastic. Okay, in conclusion, interlanguage is the current form of a person's grammar rules. Those rules could be changed through hypothesis testing, through errors, through application of general rules to more contexts, okay? Okay, so thank you very much. Now, let me end the recording.